welcome to the participants that are joining. We're just going to wait a couple of minutes as, as people join. What was the hashtag again? Uh, WBG Commission. Oh, great. Okay, I'm gonna kick off just because um, we've only got an hour and we don't wanna spend too much time uh, waiting, people will join in any case. So welcome to today's seminar uh, run by the Women's Budget Group um, and in conjunction with the commission, the Commission on a Gender Equal Economy, which is something that many of us on this call today have been part of. Um, the session today, and this is the third seminar in a series uh, connected to the Commission, is called A Care-Led Recovery and Building Back Better. And of course, uh, the Commission, as it was set up, was always meant to focus on issues of care, but it's become even more important in light of everything that's happened in the last six months um, with COVID-19. And when we talk about that, we're not just talking about the social care sector, which of course has been um, incredibly affected um, and you know, all kinds of problems, whether it be the wages of care workers, the lack of sick pay, um, the lack of protective equipment, um, the way in which those uh, care homes are run. But it's not just that, of course, it's also the way in which uh, the COVID has played out for women, women at home looking after kids and how school closures has disproportionately affected women. It's really a reminder of how much work there is still to do on gender equality. Um, so really happy to be chairing this session today. I should introduce myself, I'm Faiza Shaheen. I'm the Director of Class, the Centre for Labour and Social Studies. And we've got an incredible group of women speaking today um, and lots of topics we want to cover. Just a couple of things. Um, the hashtag for today is WBG Commission. So do um, tweet and use that hashtag, WBG Commission. Um, if you've got questions, please put it in the Q&A box because um, Hannah from Women's Budget Group will be picking those up. Don't put it in the comment, sec uh, comment section, put it in the Q&A box. Um, use the, co the comment chat section to um, share resources if you want, but do keep questions in Q&A. Uh, what else? Okay, yes, this is being recorded just so you know, um, and I, I guess will be available later on. Um, Today, the sorts of questions we're going to be asking include who do we need, why do we need a new approach in the way we value paid and unpaid care? How do we invent care, reinvent care, I should say, as part of our social infrastructure? How and why must the recovery from coronavirus center care in order to build a fairer, more caring economy and a gender equal economy? Um, and one of the questions that I'm going to ask each of the speakers as well is about what the barriers are. It really strikes me and I know like Anne and Sue, um, you know, we've been talking about these things or, you know, you've been talking about these things for a very, very long time. Um, and it's just obvious, it obviously makes sense. So understanding why we're not seeing the change, even in the aftermath of COVID-19, we would have expected much more focus at this point. We're not really hearing too much. Um, so what really are the barriers to this happening? So um, I'm going to be really strict with the speakers because I want to make sure we get in some questions towards the end. Um, so each of the speakers, at five minutes, I'll either wave or say um, 30 seconds remaining um, and then we'll move on. But there'll be more opportunities for you to come back once we've heard from some of the audience. So I'm timing this. Um, let's start with Sue. Sue Hemingway is an emeritus professor at, the, at Open University and has done a lot of work on gender in the economy. Um, is much admired by many of us. Thank you, Sue. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me here. Um, one of the things that we've learned from the pandemic is how important paid and unpaid care is. It's the backbone of our society and the way we put it in Women's Budget Group is that it's a key part of our social infrastructure. The, and we're finding that the effects of COVID-19 are threatening both the child care and the social care providers. 
and therefore also the prospects of women who rely on them to relieve some unpaid work. Um, both sectors are in dire need of reform and we had even before the pandemic one and a half million people with unmet social care needs in only just over half of local authorities could parents be sure of finding the child care they needed and as you probably know it's the most expensive in Europe to parents and overall access to care is grossly uneven on top of that it's a sector that runs on low pay and insecure employment it's largely women and they're often BME women who are paid the minimum wage and many of whom are on zero hours contracts with huge turnover rates Currently, there are well over 100,000 vacancies, and that's not really surprising given the lack of training and career structure in the industry. So it basically has a business model that fuels a lack of ambition to high quality care. So what do we need to do instead? Well, we have talked about having a care-led recovery. We need it to transform our broken care system and invest in social, our social infrastructure. We talk about it as investment, because in spending on care improves our future well-being, prevents greater need in the future. So that's what investment is, spending for benefits in the future. And we talk about it as infrastructure because it has benefits beyond its direct users. It has benefits for the whole community in the same way that we, we think about physical infrastructure. So a better care system would have certain characteristics. First of all, it would require that a greater proportion of the total work workforce be employed in the care sector. We give up, we spend not enough time on care, not enough of our employed time on care. And this would need to be a permanent change. So what I'm talking about is a long-term approach with long-term benefits. But on top of this, investing in care is actually a very good way of generating jobs. When you, have, when you look at how many jobs are generated by a particular economic stimulus, you have to look at, first of all, the jobs that are directly generated by investing in, say, a social, social care or in building a bridge that so will directly um, produce some jobs. But there'll also be jobs indirectly produced in the industries that supply that, the industries in which you directly invested. And then there'll be induced jobs created by the spending of those people newly employed directly or indirectly by the investment. Now, one of the things that we have found out through our own simulations is that any investment in care creates far more jobs than a similar investment in construction. So Hannah, could you put up my slide now? Um, and another thing that we found out is that investment in care also results in more revenue being re recouped through increased taxes. So if you spend on care, you employ a huge number of people and therefore you get more of it back in taxes. So the relative gains of employment for investing in care are even greater when you compare the net costs. Um, and that's especially true since investing in care also expands the labor force so its economic benefits continue even when the economy appears to be at full capacity. So you not only create jobs, you also create the people free to, do, to take those jobs. So let's have a look at the, a comparison. Um, if, say, we were like some Scandinavian countries and the UK invested enough in care to have 10% of its total employment of people, people employed in care. That would create about 2 million jobs overall. And it would also have a huge impact on the gender employment gap. It would create far more jobs than investing the same net amount in construction. If you look at the graph that's on the screen now, the left-hand side of the graph shows what the difference would be between spending the same net amount um, if you paid people at current wages in care. So you'd create more than three times as many jobs if you spent that money on care than if you spent it on construction. And more than five times as many jobs for women. But actually, because there's so many more jobs overall, you'd still get 10% more jobs for men. So both care and construction are extremely gender segregated industries. Actually, construction even more so than care. 
but because you get so many more jobs out of spending on care than you'd get out of spending on construction, you'd actually get more jobs for men too. But the right hand sh side shows more the sort of thing that we would like, because we think that, that care workers need to be better paid. In fact, they will need to be better paid if you're going to recruit them, since they can't be recruited at current wages. Um, so with the, the right hand simulation shows what would happen if we paid care workers 45% more than they're currently paid on average, which would roughly match Denmark's wages as a proportion of its average wage. In which case, you'd still create more than twice as many jobs as investing the same amount of money in construction, more than four times as many for women, and roughly the same number for men. So while investment in- 30 seconds, Sue, sorry. Hmm? 30 seconds. Okay, while investment in construction increases the gender employment gap, investment in care reduces it. And because of the current unequal distribution of care facilities, investing in care would also mean providing jobs in areas of, dis of deprivation. So it would not only be the people directly involved in care, but children, older and disabled people, and the whole community would benefit. So what we'd argue is that a care-led recovery would transform care services for them who need them, generate significant employment, reduce the gender employment gap, and create a healthier, better educated and a more productive population. Um, and of course, such an investment would also be sustainable because instead of producing more things, in the future, we all need to be caring for each other better and learning how to do so better. That's it. Great, thank you so much for that introduction, Sue, and really just setting out the very strong case for investment in care. Um, and I remember some years ago doing some research on where all the low paid jobs were, and it really struck me um, when you looked at non-graduate -grad jobs, um, men in non-graduate jobs and looked at the sorts of sectors in the pay versus where women were in care and the, and the differential in pay, it really did strike me that the economy is sexist. There's something going on within the economy in the way in which the pay system works. But maybe I'll come back to you on that in a second. So next we have um, Sarah Bedford, who's the head of social policy at the New Economics Foundation, um, which was uh, actually maybe several of us have worked at NEF before and has certainly been doing work on this for some time and, and at a time when no one was really talking about it and pushing this agenda was, um, you know, was really um, pioneering work in this area. So I'll hand over to you, Sarah, thank you. Thanks, Pfizer. Um, so at, at NEF, we tend to think of care as part of the core economy. Um, and this is a concept that describes the human resources embedded in our everyday lives and the relationships between us things like time, experience, knowledge, skills, and empathy. And they're core cool because they're essential to society um, and without them, the economy would grind to a halt. But the core economy is not uh, inherently good or right. It reproduces divisions and inequalities and most of its transactions involve women working without wages. So it matters how the core economy develops. It can flourish and expand or it can weaken and contract. Um, depending on the conditions in which it operates. And uh, those conditions include the state of our public services, which we might think of as social infrastructure that supports the core economy. Um, and I'm going to spend the next few minutes uh, just talking about social care as an example of that. Um, social care is a public service that's been in decline, particularly over the past 10 years. And we've seen the consequences during the pandemic, as Pfizer's already said. Uh, and it's clear now, I think, more than ever before, that social care is in dire need of investment. Um, so what direction should that investment take? Uh, I'm going to suggest five, five priorities for building back better. Uh, the first is a mission-led approach. And by that, I mean setting a goal that is based on a positive vision for social care and how it might change us as a society for the better. Uh, and I think that's important for two reasons. One, one is to help us to steer towards the positive and away from the negative uh, in the knowledge that high quality care can support people to lead full lives. It can enrich communities by enabling more people to participate and it has the potential to provide good jobs for paid carers in all parts of the country. 
um, while also enabling unpaid carers to make freer choices about work. I think the other reason is to bring people with us um, because a lot of people don't really understand social care until it touches our lives in some way. And I think we need to get better at explaining what good social care is and why it matters. The second priority is universal entitlement. Um, currently, individuals and families bear a lot of the risk and the cost burden of needing care, which isn't fair or equitable or particularly sustainable. Um, but I think a question here is universal entitlement to what? Uh, a lot of proposals for free social care are just for free personal care. And that would be a huge step forward in England. But at the same time, social care is bigger than personal care. It's not just about meeting physical needs. So where do we draw the boundaries around free social care? And is it just personal care? Um, the third priority uh, is national standards. Currently, services are a mix of good and bad. People using services lack meaningful control over those services a lot of the time and the work is badly paid and increasingly insecure. So there's a need to lift up the quality of support and the quality of jobs at, at the same time. Um, the fourth priority is local control. Uh, people have diverse needs, so a top-down, one-size-fits-all approach won't work. And in my view, it's right to look to local government as a democratically accountable body to organise social care. But I think we need a new and much more expansive role for local government because currently they tend to outsource services um, using competitive tendering approaches that are often short termist and can be cost driven and therefore favour big providers that deliver social care on the cheap. But a mission led approach would require local government to direct and coordinate social care working collaboratively with local partners that are also driven by purpose and not by profit. And to support the development of new care models um, and in particular, I think, models that shift power to people using services and care workers. Uh, and some local authorities are trying to work in these ways, but they're hampered by constant financial pressure. And so I think the fifth priority has to be a long term funding settlement, um, which needs to achieve a number of things. I think it has to be capable of collecting enough funds to sustain a higher quality, more universal social care system that has room to be creative and to experiment. Um, it should be progressive if we want the social care system to be equitable and it has to be politically feasible as well. So there's a balance there to strike. Uh, so those are my suggestions for, for priorities. Um, and I just wanted to finish by kind of building what, on what Sue's already said and making the economic in case for investment at this particular moment in time um, and giving three reasons for that. Um, the first is to support the economic recovery. Um, as the furlough system winds down, we know that 1.4 million furlough people are at risk of unemployment and almost a third of companies plan to cut jobs in the next three months. And as Sue said, there's huge potential to create jobs and stimulate the economy through public sector spending and social care. The second reason is uh, to support a green economic recovery. And I know that the other speakers on this call will talk more about that. Um, but to put the economy on a more sustainable footing, we, we need to green production and consumption, but we also, I think, need to shift towards production and consumption that's already green. And that includes social care, um, which along with other social sectors like health and education is eight times less carbon intensive than the average of all industries. Um, and the third and final reason I, I just wanted to give is to support an economic recovery that can address inequalities in a lot of different ways. Um, because improving access to care and the quality of care can help to reduce barriers to participation in social and economic life that are faced by disabled and older people, particularly those on, on low incomes. Um, and it can also contribute to a fairer distribution of care work by relieving the burden on unpaid carers who are predominantly women. But I think it can only do that effectively if we value paid care work more highly, especially because care workers are also predominantly women and disproportionately women of colour. So investing in improving the quality of existing jobs is probably even more important than creating new jobs. I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, Sarah, thank you. Um, I guess just the reminder there, maybe we'll get to dwell, delve into this a bit more about the, the model by which uh, the care sector is run. So that point about who has control and local authorities. So it's not just about funding, although that's a big part of it. It's also the way in which the care sector is currently um, led, uh, currently delivered. 
Okay, so um, Anne Petter for is next. She needs no introduction. Uh, she's the director of Prime, uh, and is also on the commission um, on a gender equal economy, um, and has uh, worked on all kinds of issues and brought all and raised awareness on all kinds of issues. Probably one of the most recently that is that is around austerity and, and public spending cuts and why that was a bad idea, but. Further back than that, she was really well known for the Jubilee Debt campaign. So I'll hand over to you, Anne. I know you're going to speak about the, the links between the care economy and a Green New Deal. Thanks. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Pfizer. And thank you also to Sue and Sarah for your presentations. Um, it, I think it shows us why the forthcoming report from the Women's Budget Group Commission is going to be such an exciting and important and landmark event, actually. I think Sue's um, research on how investment in care creates jobs is really, really encouraging. Um, and I just wanted to add one thing, and that is that investment in jobs and in well-paid jobs also fixes the public finances. Because the fact of the matter is, as long as you have low-paid, insecure uh, work and high levels of unemployment, public finances are going to be out of sync. We need a decent wages. We need a wage-led recovery in order to fix the public finances. So we need to see this not just as a women's issue, but as in this global macro perspective, is that the world needs this. Now, I wanted to just make three points. Number one, the pandemic has showed us how absolutely useless capitalism has proved to our survival, right? So it cannot, capitalism has not been able to uh, ensure public health. It's not been able to create jobs and it's not able to decarbonize uh, the, 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 uh, ecos the uh, atmosphere. So we have, a, we have a system, an economic system that is really failing at the re really important fundamentals. That's my first point. My second point is what the pandemic taught us was that we could live without effectively the oligarchs. Well, maybe not Jeff Bezos who managed to thrive through this pandemic, but most of the 1% were entirely irrelevant to this crisis. Highly paid footballers were locked up in their locker rooms and utterly useless in this, this crap. The people that mattered were the social workers, the health workers, the shelf stackers, the truck drivers, they kept us alive. And what that teaches me is that we make the economy. We, the working population, make the economy. That, that, that without us, people would have died and did die, right? You know, I, I did a presentation to the European Parliament in which I said, if you don't have this kind of care, you can get killed. And it's as, it is really as stark as that. And that was a powerful lesson for us to learn. My third point is this, that in economic terms, capitalism doesn't understand the importance of care to its own health. You know, our government doesn't understand that it cannot just harangue people to go back to work if it doesn't provide decent childcare. And I speak as a grandmother and as I watch my children struggle with keeping their jobs going and get, looking after the, the children and their boys and, you know, letting them go to school while at least being able to work. In, and they are not keen to leave their children to, you know, market forces, uh, to the brutality of market forces. So um, I think for those reasons, we really need a, a care-led recovery, as, as the Women's Budget uh, uh, Group is going to report in this forthcoming report but also in macroeconomic terms, a wage-led recovery. That's the only kind of recovery we can have. Thank you. Great, thanks, Anne, and very, um, very good with your timing there as well. Um, no, and I think that's a really important point about, well, given that you've saved some time, I might ask you this question now. I mean, it does, you know, whether you listen to Sue or Sarah or yourself, you look at what we could do on care and how it could help people's health, how it could help equality, whether it's women's equality, whether it's issues of um, race equality. Um, if you look at regional inequalities, you know, this government apparently really wants to level up the UK. I mean, across the board, it makes sense for us to be investing in care and yet we haven't done it. What to you are the main barriers? 
Oh gosh, you know, I was I was wondering how I was going to answer this question because, of course, it's to do with this deeply embedded sexism. Uh, it's to do with the profound conservatism of our governments and our um, Whitehall institutions. Um, it's to do with the failure of the economics profession and how to overcome all those barriers simultaneously. Well, the point is, we know we can do it because we've done it before. We have had experience of rapid transitions away from rotten old systems into new systems. But what it takes is some momentum and some leadership, some thought leadership and momentum. And as someone who lived through the transformation of apartheid South Africa, that's someone who's lived through what happened around the Berlin Wall, as someone that's lived through what's happening on the climate. I think we've got to say that the people can make this happen. And, and, and I think what it takes, it takes us understanding our power, you know, that, that the system wouldn't function without, tax, without our tax revenues. And by the system, I mean the central bank. I mean, you know, the international finance, I mean, Wall Street in the city of London. They would be lost without bailouts from publicly backed, taxpayer backed institutions like the central bank. So we need to understand we have that power and to use that power. And I think it's that, my hope is it's that understanding that will break down the barriers, but who knows? Okay, great. And um, that actually is a really good introduction into Danielle Pathard, who's the head of organizing at the Green New Deal, who can perhaps give us some thoughts about, as well about how we organize our power and what we do at this point to, you know, this report will be amazing and it will tell us what we need to do, but there's always that, you know, taking us to what we, the vision and, and the policy, how we get there in, the, in a world which is incredibly sexist and still very mainstream economics. Thanks, Danny. Hi, um, yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's lovely to be amongst all the the thinkers um, and you know I've got I've got no thoughts but um, yeah I guess kind of think of ourselves as like the doers um, I'm from Green New Deal UK which was an organization set up um, last November to build the kind of momentum and movement behind the ideas um, the idea of a Green New Deal um, and in uh, and then obviously kind of COVID happened and we like pivoted to like launch the Build Back Better campaign, which was about like making sure that we didn't, um, you know, that the response, the recovery from coronavirus did kind of build, but was a, one that built back better um, for people, for, for planet, um, for communities um, with like, you know, strong investment in public services and also, um, you know, creation of green jobs and like a kind of re rewriting the rules um, that kind of govern society. Um, and uh, so yeah we've been involved in kind of leading that coalition of about 100 organizations um, to kind of push that message and thinking about okay so how do we you know what's the context we're in and how, how do we win and I think what we know is that we have a government that is extremely good at campaigning um, they are using they moved extremely quickly into the build back better frame they started talking about a new deal with only kind of one two hundredth of the investment um, that uh, Roosevelt put into the actual New Deal. And um, so they're like extremely savvy campaigners. Um, they're also not really interested in what campaigners have to say, uh, I think it's fair to say, and like ideologically opposed to like a lot of the things we're talking about. However, they are susceptible to public pressure in some forms and are prepared to do U-turns in all sorts of places, as we saw with like, you know, the one useful intervention from a footballer <laughs> uh, with Marcus Rashford. Um, and also, I think obviously we are in this moment of big kind of change about like public opinion, about like what is possible, like what people even think the government can do if it puts its mind to doing it. And I think that's a really interesting kind of public perception shift of, um, you know, how, how we leverage that like change of mindset. Um, also recognizing that in the kind of current parliamentary arith arithmetic, there are a lot of kind of new um, conservative seats that with new politicians who are going to be particularly susceptible to kind of public pressure and like how do we um, how do we cultivate that um, and um, so some of the things that we have been thinking about with the with the you know the build back better campaign like what we know what we need to kind of get the kind of um, changes that the women's budget group is talking about is like 
number one, a kind of active base of support and organizers who are out kind of championing this and pushing for this and organizing. Second of all, you need passive support kind of from the population um, to kind of uh, support the ideas. And third, obviously, you need political support in like whatever kind of machination that means for, for a particular piece of um, legislation. And so I think the things that, um, you know, some of the things that we've been focusing on are like, number one, like socializing the idea of kind of building back better and what a kind of care led recovery looks like and feels like and what that means. Um, and we um, did lots of um, published some polling with NEF around only 6% of the population wanting, you know, wanting us to go back to kind of business as usual, um, which was really, uh, you know, which got like kind of fairly widespread coverage um, and looking at kind of storytelling from um, we've been doing lots of storytelling with frontline workers, including nurses um, and care workers about like what their vision for the future is and how we use this moment to like lift up the kind of charis the voices of the charismatic frontline workers who people have suddenly kind of really zoomed in on and been like, these guys are the bedrock, let's listen to them and how do we amplify what they're saying. Um, and um, I think coming up, I think the budget um, upcoming budget is going to be a key. We're, we'll be framing that as like a litmus test for you know what the government is doing on this, which is not going to be enough. Um, and really pushing on the like green jobs angle. And I think you know really pushing that when people think of green jobs, it's kind of like chaps in hard hats and solar panels, and that's not what a green job is. And so how do we like really push that like care, education, all of this stuff? That's the green economy. That's the sustainable economy. And so. Um, we're looking to work on a few um, kind of high profile interventions around that time that pushes that message um, and we'll be continuing uh, to do um, local organising and we've been encouraging people to do community sign ons so getting local or like grouping together organisations in their area to sign up to kind of you know to put pressure on their MP to build that better um, and we'll be encouraging people across November to do like a visioning event locally with care workers with teachers with kind of key pillars of the community and um, so those are some of the like mechanisms coming up um, and opportunities and that's my time great thank you danielle thanks for that um great so who better to reflect on what we can do inside and outside of parliament uh, than our next speaker nadia whittam who is the mp for nottingham east um, and has, you know, herself worked in the social care sector and was working in the care sector and went back to working in the care sector as the COVID-19 lockdown happened. Um, yeah, and um, I can't, hang on one sec, sorry, I can't see you. Um, okay, there you are. Okay, great. Nadia, handing over to Nadia. Thanks. Thank you so much, Pfizer, and thank you to the Women's Project Group for organising this. It's fantastic to be able to speak on a panel on an issue that is so personally um, close to my heart. Just checking that everyone can hear me because I'm using these wireless AirPods and sometimes it feels like they're not working. Okay, that's good. <laughs> um, as Pfizer said, I was a care worker before I became an MP and I returned to care work during the COVID crisis because I thought that it was at real risk of falling apart and I knew that even in ordinary times that the um, that the burden of social care is carried by low paid, predominantly women and also disproportionately women of colour and migrant women workers. Now, you probably remember that I spoke out about a lack of PPE and after that I was told that my services were no longer, le no longer needed and because I was on a zero hours contract as I was before, um, before I became an MP, I I didn't have any sort of recourse to a meeting with my union rep or any due process. Now, that's not really the story here, that an MP on a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm on a big wage as an MP, loses second job on just over the minimum wage. The point is that if this can happen to an MP, just imagine the level of insecurity and precariousness and intimidation that other care workers experience on a daily basis. So after that I invited care workers to contact me and lo and behold my experience was not a one-off but it was actually alarmingly prevalent across the entire care sector. 
people from care workers from Northern Ireland, London, the South Coast, the North of England, all four corners of the nation contacted me with similar experiences. They spoke to me about a lack of PPE, a lack of testing, um, feeling unsafe on the front line during the pandemic, and just how poorly they felt treated by both their employer and by the government. So after that, I organised a Zoom call for these whistleblowers, which protected their anonymity. And that was a really emotional moment of solidarity for me and for all of us, I think. And as a group, we're working together with unions and um, currently discussing our next steps as a campaign. It's clear to me, and it should be clear to anyone in Parliament, that the rights of care workers and the functionality of the care sector is at once a feminist issue, it's a social justice issue, and it's a worker and migrants' rights issue. Now, COVID has really shown social care and our social care system to be not fit for purpose. But before then, since 2010, about 7.7 .7 billion has been cut from the social care budget. It's been privatised, fragmented. It has a very, very low trade union density in the, the care workforce. So it's up to us to speak out on behalf of the tens of thousands of mainly women who were less able to speak out for fear of losing their jobs and also to amplify the voices of those people who are speaking out. The Prime Minister's talking about Build Back Better but what's really jarring is that his vision excludes completely any investment in the care sector. So I'm not sure how successful you've been in being able to secure a meeting with the government, but it seems to me that they could certainly do with a few lessons in feminist economics and gender budgeting. I think we've got to galvanise this unique moment that has brought care workers to the front of public consciousness after our weekly capping for care workers but more widely than that this is an opportunity to rebuild after covid and to radically restructure our economy into a green economy mm -hmm. and as part of that it's reimagining what our social care system looks like not as something that's separate to the rest of society or viewing people as helpless who should have things done onto them but as people with agency because we need a social care policy that maximizes people's autonomy that is written by users by workers and by wider society and as other people have mentioned that's not just about funding but it's about looking at alternative models of ownership and models of ownership that give people and communities power long-lasting power that they can hold on to. So from my perspective, I'll continue to work from Parliament to, to look for ways to raise the economic and social benefits of a post-COVID economic recovery that centres on care. And I'm really looking forward to working together with everyone on this call and people in the audience to take that forward. Thanks. Great, thank you so much for that, Nadine. So helpful as well to get your like insight of what was happening. Many of us were, you know, watching you on Newsnight and and hearing about what had happened to you in that situation for, from speaking out. And, um, you know, it actually really did help to raise awareness of 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 the issues. So thank you for your leadership on that. Um, and on so many issues like um, immigration. Now that I've got the chance to say that to you. Um, I just wondered actually, something that a union organiser said to me recently, who um, oversees union organising for one of the big unions in the care sector, was that she, you know, she feels that um, carers are very upset and angry as to, as to what's happened to the sector. Um, and she feels that there's more, um, there's more energy to, to protest, to take action, to strike, etc., in a way that she didn't feel was there you know, maybe a year ago. Um, I just wondered, you know, what your sense is from your old colleagues and going back, um, because I think one of the things that Anne pointed out are the, the barriers to change as, you know, we, can't, we do need to organize um, and we do need to have public momentum. 
um, for change. And while if you ask people and you survey them, they of course would never say we shouldn't invest more in care. We're not out on the streets about it though, are we? So I, I just would be really interested in your views on that. What's what, you know, what's the energy in the care sector right now? Um, and, and what's the value of protest at this point? And how we can support the care sector and carers? That's a really interesting question. That's something that I'm going to give a bit of thought to over the course of this discussion. But I think from my experience, my, my colleagues, are all extremely dedicated, hardworking and very, very caring people who, you know, we, we don't, when the social care budget is cut, people's care needs don't go away. And the people who pick up the work for that is the lowest paid care workers. And I think people would be very reluctant to, to go on strike or to raise too much of a fuss because we know that we know how important our jobs are, that often we're the only people who someone will see in a day, that it depends on us as to whether a more serious health need will be picked up. Um, people's well-being and mental health often depends on the, the level of care that we're able to provide. So I think that there needs to be a lot of public support so that it doesn't fall on care workers to be raising this, but other people are saying, this isn't on and you deserve better and we will stand with you and stand behind you and where necessary stand for you to make sure that that happens. Great thanks Nadia and I, I just to say for people please do write um, questions in Q&A we've got sort of 15 minutes left and I'll, I'll pick up on some of that. Um, can I um, just there's actually a question here that Sarah probably be a good one for you which is um, what leadership should local government be giving to create empowering models of working in care? Yeah, I, th I think there's also um, a link question, uh, which is which, which local authorities? And I think that might have been in response to when I said that some local authorities are trying to start doing things differently. Um, so I guess they're sort of two sides of the, of the same coin. Um, I think... Uh, I think there are pockets uh, where local authorities are trying to do things differently. I think we see more of that in uh, Scotland and Wales, perhaps, than we see in England. Um, and there's one sort of example that is, is um, kind of worth noting in, in Wales, I think, uh, where actually the government is working with a group of academics who um, call themselves the Foundational Economy Collective. Um, who are uh, very interested in questions around uh, kind of how we improve this huge sector of the economy that provides the kind of foundational goods and services that we all depend on, um, with social care being a really big uh, part of that. Um, and uh, they are trying to kind of bring together people using services and uh, care workers and providers um, to think about how to do things differently. So collaboration um, is a really big part of it and so is being willing to be experimental and recognising that practice at the moment isn't working. Um, and they've also got kind of support of legislation in Wales um, which supports an increased role for more inclusive forms of ownership in social care like uh, cooperatives. Um, so I think that's something that can make a difference as well. But I guess my, my impression is very much that it does feel like it's uh, baby steps in, in a lot of places. And I think a big part of the reason for that is the huge financial pressure that local authorities have been under. I, th I think, Faisa, I think it's hard really to ask this of local authorities because as the TUC have shown in their recent report on care, you know, George Osborne was a political coward and he delegated the cuts. You know, he didn't inflict cuts via Whitehall, his own institutions where he was in charge. He delegated those cuts to local governments and he made local authorities and, and politicians at local le uh, level pay for that. But also most particularly, he had, they've cut social, social care or pay, or the finance for social care is no higher today than it was in 2010. And yet local authorities have got so many challenges to deal with. So I don't know, I think it's, 
you know, we, we deliberately undermined local and democratic government, deliberately undermined it. And now to expect that sector to lead the brigade, uh, lead the, you know, the, the, the march against this is, I think that's really hard. I think it requires a nationwide campaign of grown-ups, of men and women, young and old, who are utterly dependent for their survival on the health sector, on health workers, on low paid health workers, on truck drivers, on, on, on the cleaners in hospitals. We need these people. We need to make it a bigger issue than a local authority one, in my view. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Anne. I mean, one thing that I notice locally is how often the council will get blamed for everything. Yeah. <laughs> People often forget all of the cuts that they faced. Um, and it's a lot then to ask them on top of not having the money to be innovative and come up with new models. Um, so thank you for that. Can I, um, can I bring in Sue? Sue, do you, do you want to make any comments on that? And just also, just to go back to one of my original questions about, you know, what you think the barriers are to change and why we're not seeing the shifts that we've, you know, that you've campaigned on, you've worked on for such a long time. Copy it. Sue, I think you're muted. Still muted. That's it. That's it. I think to, to, we 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 um, change in the opposite directions. Um, I've given a presentation like this to a number of different places, and I'm very struck by how usually people think it's a good idea by the time I've finished the presentation. But then when they put out their next pronouncement on something, they've forgotten about it. Um, and, and I think that that's partly structurally about where care is in our economy and then therefore in people's minds. Um, and while it's really what I might expect of the government at the moment, it isn't what I expect of all our friends. Um, and I'm, and I'm rather struck by how the people that we would consider as receptive to these ideas, again, they, they behave a little bit the same way. They say, oh yes, that's a good idea. And then when you get out the next pronouncement on a green transition, for example, care is sort of in there, but it's not there very centrally. So there is a recognition that we need to have a better health um, care and education system. But the focus is very much on the things that um, are the change from here to a greener economy, not so much on what the greener economy would be like. And I would like to see much more focus on, well, if we're going to live in a more environmentally sustainable way, what's that economy itself going to look like? And it seems to me that it's going to have to be one on which we are spending more of our time caring for each other, educating each other, looking after each other. Mm -hmm. um, and the transition to that is just as important, if you like, as fixing our buildings so that they don't, so that not so much emissions are created. Because if we end up with a society in which everybody is still going out producing things to be sold and, and it's, not going, it's not going to be a greener society, even if we live in more environmentally sustainable buildings. So yeah. I think that a switch within the green agenda to a bigger look at what the sort of economy we want at the end of it all is, um, and therefore the steps we have to take right now to get there would be really important. I was just thinking, Sue, thank you for that, um, that actually, Danny, when you spoke about just now about seeing care jobs as green jobs, that's one of the first times I've heard people really directly working on the Green New Deal say that you know really not to say that they're not thinking it but actually in our conceptualization of green I mean every job should be a green job right I mean that's kind of what we should be thinking of um so it'd be good to kind of come back to you about what um how specifically we can make that happen Sue I've got another thing for you because someone has just asked a question so you can say more um so one of the things so this is John Crow on um Q&A he said would it push for reform of the way GDP is measured so that includes the value of unpaid work help to stimulate government to take care more seriously or would it undermine improving paid care workers pay and conditions so this is about the fundamental reform in which we need to understand um the economy and what is being productive and all of those terms that really get on my nerves um so if you want to come back on that quickly we've only got a few minutes left um, and there's one final thing that i'm going to get everyone to say is that I think people here have hinted or, or directly said that this is a difficult time for progressive change because of the makeup of parliament. Um, 
if you think in a year from now, what to you would be a positive step forward? And, you know, obviously in the context in which we're in, it, it's difficult, but what to you would, you know, on this particular issue would be a sign of success. And I will start by saying, I want us to, at the International Women's Day next year in March, I want us to have a big march that goes out and specifically talks about carers and care work and really focuses in on the issues and try to get as many people out as possible. Hopefully, you know, COVID restrictions, you know, won't be in place in the same way by then. So that's one thing that I, I need to talk to the TUC about, but I'm saying right now so that I've said it out loud and I'll be forced to do something about it. So do you want to come back on that GDP question? And I will. I will also come back on what you said so you don't need to come back to me again because I like your idea, but I would like it to be full of male trade unionists too. I would like it to be like the abortion march that I went in, went on when I was in my 20s, which was the, one of the largest marches that ever been organised by the TUC, full of male trade unionists, all about a woman's issue. Care isn't just a women's issue. Care is an issue for us all, but it's women who are, who are leading on it. On GDP, I don't want to measure GDP differently. I just want to be clear that we that we we need to the GDP is not the how we should be running the economy. It's a it's a side issue. It's a way of counting out what goes through the market. It isn't anything. It wasn't never designed to be a measure of well-being. We need a measure of well-being. The measure of well-being, I think, is what people can do and can be. Um, and we need to we need that way of thinking about what the economy is all about. Great. I want, can I, I want you to want to, you want to come back on that and also come back on what you would see as a, a successful step forward in a year's time? Well, I thank you, um, Pfizer. I was going to ask Sarah to repeat her numbers on uh, the carbon intensive nature of, of care. I thought that was very powerful and I want to remember it and get others to think about it more. I mean, I, what would be a, a successful step? I think what would be a successful step would be if, as Sue has argued, we stop thinking about this as a women's issue. That's the problem. It's being compartmentalized. It's not a women's issue. And it's not just a national issue. It's actually, and it's also an international issue. The fact is that we've had falling wages over a long period of time. That's led to higher levels of borrowing. The working people have become borrowers as a class and corporations have become lenders as a class. That's led to international financial crises and international financial instability. This is not a women's issue. This is a, a profoundly important economic issue. And I want us to, re for me, what would be success would be, yes, when the blokes are talking about this. And by that, I mean you know, both on the shop floor, but also in the House of, Par House of Commons, and where they're understanding what it is, you know, in the way that they now understand that the climate is, is an issue that affects all of us. It's not just for Greens, you know. That would be, for me, a, a step forward. What, what can we do to do? I know we're running out of time, but just like one thing that you think could help, because I guess one of the things I was thinking about this Women's Day March was partly because just to raise the issue so we could talk about it and say what you're saying yeah, yeah. and get men out as well. But I just wondered... You've got all your campaigning experience. <laughs> it's so difficult. I mean, this is the thing, right? I mean. So my campaigning experience is this, that you have to think about an issue so carefully and then to carve it out into, to cut it like a diamond so that it reflects very widely. And we're still at that stage with this issue, believe it or not, you know, we're still mm -hmm. not yet integrating this issue into the, the bigger picture and including everybody in it. Okay. So for That's me, a bit what, of a message to women's budget group, isn't it? To, it is indeed. I guess and, some more funding and higher campaigners and, and communicate. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And, and I'm sorry not to answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, Anne. I'm sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. Um, Danny, can we come back to you? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think success, success for me in a year's time is, I guess, kind of like building, I think building on like Nadia's contribution and then I guess what we have talking about just now about, you know, success in a year's time is that like trade union membership is up, but that like kind of vocal empowered kind of caucus of care workers is like out on the streets, is like has, you know, is demanding what they need to and the movement is rallying behind them um, all ages, like, men, women, everyone alike. Um, 
And so I think it's like tangibly seeing on the ground that like those voices have been lifted up and are being effectively organized and organizing themselves. And I think that is what a success will look like in a year's time. Um, That's perfect. Thanks, Danny. I feel like we are coming to a bit of a consensus on that, though maybe Sarah will have something different to say. Just to, just to say to people, um, Ria from GMB has put up some reports um, that GMB have done on this in the chat, so do have a look at that. Um, and apparently John McDonnell was on this call as well, which is great. Um, Sarah, do you want to give us your thoughts on where we should be in a year, what you'd like to see? I guess I, I, I would echo a lot of what you've said, Pfizer, and what other people have said. And I guess I would just sort of add, if one of the main messages that we want people to kind of be um, picking up on and, and saying more is that this isn't just a women's issue. I, you know, I think that's completely right. But I think another message as well is it's not an issue for a minority of us who, who need care. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're all dependent on each other um, and actually most of us at some point in our lives will depend on the paid care system whether it's childcare or, or social care so this is something that affects everyone. To say you said um, and asked that question it was it's eight times less carbon intensive right? Than Along with other social sectors like health and education than the average of all industries. Great thank you Sarah I'm gonna Nadia give you the, the last word on this. Sorry, I'm just jotting down that statistic. That's very helpful. Um, I think there are three things that I'd like to see change in the next year. One is trade union membership amongst care workers increase. Mm -hmm. um, the second is a Labour Party social care policy that's written by care workers and users of social care. And when I say users, that's really pretty broad, as Sarah said all of us rely on the social care system at some point. It's not just older people, but if you're lucky enough to live to old age, then you will almost definitely use social care services. And the third is for politicians to be talking about this as the serious economic issue that it is. Great, thank you, Nadia. And we're, we're lucky to have you, you know, making these points because I'm sure there's very few people in parliament that have had the experience, the lived experience that you have. Um, I'm gonna end the call in a minute just to remind people about the commission and the final report that will come out at the end of this month, which is really exciting. I feel that from the incredible contributions today, there are some ideas on how we can take that work forward and how we can really um, build action around the policy ideas and the real desperate need for change. I think from a personal level, and um, Sarah, you made me think about this, you know, when my mum was very sick, her care worker was like her best friend. Um, and, you know, she would, she was just like a, just a, became part of the family. And even when my mum passed, she came to the funeral, you know, she gave us so much support. She gave my mum support. She gave us support by being there for my mum when we were at work. So I think, you know, we all have to make those emotional connections um, and tell those stories about our own, um, our own um, uh, experiences of the care sector and how important it is. And I think when we think about messaging and how we talk about this, yes, we need to say that this isn't just a women's issue. Uh, yes, we need to talk about the economic impacts, the fact that this would create more jobs, that we need to pay people more, the equality, but we also need to think about the intrinsic uh, humanity of having care and a caring a community and caring country. So those are my final thoughts. Uh, and thank you to all of the speakers again, and thank you to Women's Budget Group and Hannah who organized this call. And thank you for all to all for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.